Welcome to My Life, Tanya Applied with Rabbi Simon Jacobson, a journey into the deepest teachings of Torah and their application to our personal, emotional, and psychological lives. A good tevoch, a good week. We continue our journey in the life-changing Sefer Tanya. This program is made possible by Rena Lights LLC, and it is an honor and memory of Rabbi Yisuf Halevi Weinberg, Olav Shalom, Ramesha Pinchas Akrein Katz, Olav Shalom, Rabbi Yehiel Akrein Khan, Olav Shalom, and it is in schus and merit of Rav Zev Yecheskel Akrein and Risha Katz, the Eidich Yomim Vishanim Tevis, for many long, healthy years. We're in the middle of chapter 8 in Tanya which is the third chapter talking about the other side in the language of the Tanya Sitra Akhra, the other side as being the parallel, the mirror image to the world of Kedusha, which is the holy side that's aligned with godliness, with aligned the purpose of existence. So we're talking about, so, that, so the Kedusha side was focused on the Nevesh Alekis, chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 which were all focused on the divine soul. And, um, and now, in chapter 6, 7, and 8, we're talking about the animal soul. So these are two parallel forces, two alter egos, that define our lives. We all have these two voices. And they're at battle with each other, which we'll discuss later in Tanya. So the Alter Rebbe has been in this comprehensive and fascinating way dissecting every component First of the Gdusha side, the holy side, which is the voice that, of transcendence, the voice that connects us to the purpose of our existence. And then there's the, this, the other voice that is focused on self and egocentric interests, self-interest, which is called, in general, the world of Klippa. Klippa is a shell, and when the shell becomes an entity of its own, an end of, of its own, it becomes a problem. In Klippa itself... We learned about two types of clippers, clipper snega and clippers, the bright clipper, the, 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 the bright clipper, the bright uh, husk, so to speak, that has some brightness in it because it's not completely concealed. And there's the shalsh clippers at meyes that are completely off limits. And we've been discussing in Tanya in these chapters, each scenario, the different scenarios of a person's life. So there are areas in life that are Kedusha, which is when you're aligned, we'll call it completely aligned and living a healthy lifestyle, which means aligned to what God wants of you. God created the human being, and you're aligned to what exactly you were told to do. That's called Kedusha. As he explained earlier in chapter 6, that that means something is bottled to Alakus. Everything that's bottled, which means it's not focused on its own identity and self, it's focused as something other than self, higher than self, which is the divine, is Gdusha. And that's the mitzvahs of the Torah that tells us what to do and what to avoid. Then there's the other extreme, things that are usur, that are completely off limits. Destructive behavior, toxic behavior. That's called sholosh klipasat meis. And then there's that in between, which is actually the bulk of our lives, that can go in either direction. The neutral things in life, divrei rishus, Eating, drinking, sleeping, work, taking a walk, recreation, and the list goes on. That's Klippa Snege because on its own, it's about surviving. But why are you surviving? Why are you doing these things? So if it's focused and aligned L'Shem Shemayim, then it's Gedusha. In other words, it's a means to a higher end. Then it's directed towards all my actions are for the sake of heaven, meaning for the divine purpose. To honor and glorify the divine and reveal the divine purpose in the eating the meal or the other things you're partaking or, into, or, or involved in. Or it's directed the other way, towards selfish indulgence. And then, temporarily, it's controlled by the category of Shalosh Klippus So really, you can define life, and really have three options in everything. To do everything that is right and aligned with what God wants, and of course, avoid everything you don't want, or God forbid, the opposite, 
to do something and transgress and do something destructive, which is the two extremes, Kedusha and Shosh Klipsat Meis, and then the rest of the areas of life, which way are you going to direct it? Is it going to be directed toward the holy side, toward the divine, or is it going to be directed toward self-indulgence? And if it's not directed toward the divine, even if it's not completely in destru- using, let's say, eating a kosher food for a bad purpose, even if it's not for a bad purpose, if it's for, not for the divine, it's already leaning toward the other side because it's something that's not directed toward godliness means it's not godly at non- on a revealed level. And we've been discussing the different levels of how much something's aligned to God completely or not completely. And if it's not complete, it means, to use the example, then there's some dust that has gathered, toxins have gathered that need to be cleansed. They either cleanse, when Mashiach comes, everything will be cleansed, but they need to be cleansed either through our tshuva, through our work, in repairing something that was not done properly, and there are many different levels of tshuva that we discussed. You could truly do even tshuva on the category three, which is something that's completely forbidden. And we learned about that in the previous chapter. Tshuva ma'ava, that transforms even the transgressions, deliberate ones, into merits. But we're talking now, let's talk about on a milder level, something of klipas nega that was not directed properly. So he said, as long, kol mokim, mekom mokim, kaidim shechazer adover amuta legdusha, which means, before, the thing that was permitted, that's an added word, that's not the words in time, but that's what he's referring to. Before it's directed to Gdusha, before it returns and be directed to Gdusha, who sitra achir v'klipa. Because as soon as it's like saying, if it's not for me, it's against me. Which means if it's not aligned to God, so what is, so what is its role? So even though it's not maybe aligned toward the, toward the enemy of God, being against God, but as long as it's not covering, it's like saying, uh, you, let's say uh, uh, you, win, you win a battle, and you control a city. But there are people in the city, they're not for you, they're not against you. If they're not for you, they are potentially already not completely subsumed with the divine purpose for which they were created. So that's still called Sitra Achra. And as such, Sitra Achra V'Klippu, Lechein Tzorech HaGuf. And that's why when a person ate something that was kosher, mutter, something permissible, but they ate it in a way, like he said earlier, to fulfill their own desire. We're not talking about something off limits. For your own indulgence. So it's so... So that's not considered something that is completely toxic because you could easily, relatively easily direct it towards Kedusha, towards holiness, when eating it L'Shem Shemayim. But as long as it doesn't, you haven't done that, it has an effect on you. So let me address a question that somebody sent in, which is perfect, perfectly fitting to where we are right now. And then we'll continue learning and reviewing firstly what we've learned and continue on in this chapter 8 in Tanya. So someone wrote the following question. I'll just paraphrase it. We live in a world where we're not perfect. There's no human being that's perfect. We all are going to have things we do that are right and some things that are not right. When you learn Tanya, it develops such a level of guilt because even, even abrekala, the way he put it, even if you shift off just one, one millimeter, is already called sitra achre. And he writes, so I thought that Chassidus comes to teach us not to be guilty and not to put a heavier load on us. The standard here is so high, how can you expect someone to even live up to it? As soon as I hear that, it makes me want to run away. So it's a very good question. And how does it stim? It's not, you know, it's a, we know that Chassidus is not Musr. It's not about beating us up. It's not about berating. It's not about thinking about the lowliness, shiflis odom, how low we are. It's about understanding how great we can become. When you read this, it can make someone feel, no matter what you do, you're always going to be inadequate. Because for this to be on this level, you need to be at Tzad Gomer. That doesn't have a drop of anything that is not godly. We're not talking about now anti. Anti, we could say, okay, the standard is to live up to what God wants of us and not to do what God doesn't want. And we do our best. But when you start the breaking it down and defining it, it seems like a really an impossible feat. What is the Alter Rebbe really coming to teach us here? And he breaks it down. He's now talking about that. Even if you ate something kosher, we're not talking about, if you ate something not kosher, God forbid, we understand that requires even very deep tshuva or Mashiach's coming when all toxins will be eliminated from this world. 
But we're talking about eating something kosher, and it wasn't per- l'shem shemai. And still we need to have chibat ha-kevet as we learned. Chibat ha-kevet is a form of cleansing of the body, of these toxins, of, these, of, this, of this spiritual bacteria and infection that needs to be cleansed. And, we're going to be lear- and we've learned and we're going to be learning about other forms of detoxification. So it's an excellent question, and let me respond to it with a simple example. An example of a child. You have a newborn child. So I'm sure everybody remembers, those that have children, when their child was born. The purity. How pure is that child? It emerges in this world. Mom is pure. Not, no toxins. No pollutants. The body is as clean as it gets. Even when you feel it, you see a little uh, cotton. You see the cleanliness. The child has been only eating what its mother eats, so it doesn't have any of the toxic foods and processed foods that we have because the mother has processed it all and it all came, comes into the child. The child is perfect. I'm talking about, obviously, God blessing a child, Baruch Hashem, and everyone should only have healthy children. And then when a little piece of dust falls on your child, so what does a good mother or father do? You immediately wash it off. Because when you see such purity, like freshly fallen snow, every little blemish matters. That's not, to, that's not doesn't, shouldn't elicit guilt and negative feelings. On the contrary, that's the profound love when you have something and you see purity. You want to maintain that purity. What the Alter Rebbe is teaching us is actually not about, we understand there's a battle. The whole Tanya is, is going to ultimately teach us that the part of life is the battle. We're not talking about eliminating the battle. We acknowledge it. But also to recognize that that which is pure in you, know what purity is. Don't begin your life with a compromise by saying, since nobody is pure anyway, so what's the point of talking about purity? No, you want to know what is true, absolute purity. And when you understand that being connected to God creates the healthiest human being, completely aligned to the way you were meant to be, and it's something that we're not always taught. We think doing a mitzvah is because God says so. And therefore, if you do it, you get rewarded. If you don't do it, you'll be punished. As I've explained a number of times, reward and punishment are not the right words. It's cause and effect. It's when you do something that is not living up to your highest potential, there's a consequence. And that consequence is actually a blessing. It's like telling you. It's just like when a person has, let's say, get something stuck in their throat, God forbid, and you cough. The cough is not a problem. The cough is actually responding to try to eliminate that blockage. Or when you feel pain. Nobody wants pain. But pain is a warning telling you, do something about it. So essentially, what we're talking about is that the soul is so pure and so connected that when the Alter Rebbe now is explaining about the toxins that enter our lives, whether it's the toxic that comes from Shalshkip Satmei, is that we understand is something literally destructive, it's like a spiritual infection. But even things that are neutral, you're eating a regular meal, it's a kosher meal, you're eating it all properly. But it's not to the highest standard. It's not about, we expect of you to always be perfect. That's not the point. The point is that when it's not, we are sensitive. We don't say, oh, you know what, you're, you're anyway damaged goods, so who really cares? No, every piece of dust counts. It's like when you get a piece of dust in your eyeball, it's irritating. And your finger, it's meaningless. We don't want it to be meaningless. al Tareb is teaching us that's what love is. That you are such a beautiful soul. You're such a beautiful human being. Created in the divine image. Like we learned earlier, a chelikel mamash. And not just your soul is a chelikel. Your faculties, you have divine faculties. You have divine garments, thought, speech, and action. You have the potential to reach these heights. So now when we're talking the other side, in these chapters, so even wandering, wandering even a millimeter is, is significant. It matters. Because when you really love something, no detail is too small. So this is the exact opposite. It should be uplifting. And that's what the Alter Rebbe is saying. And he's going through detail. When you see it, you see a master, with like, a, like a surgeon with a scalpel. And he's looking for every, every blemish. Not because he's looking for blemishes. Not like those people we meet that are always looking to criticize and be negative. On the contrary, it's a blemish. He's looking at your child. That is a child. You want it to be perfectly clean. And you see a drop, a little stain, a little piece of dirt. You clean it off immediately. And that's what the Altareb is telling us, the process. See, so, 
And he's talking now, to come back to where we are, that we're talking now back to Dvarim Mutarim, things that are allowed, both in action, speech, and thought. So we've covered the action, the example is Mecholos, me, me eating Mecholos Kshedus, like he said, where a person eats, Dvarim Mutarim, that he's, um, that he's uh, what he said, um, That you, that you eat something that's kosher, but it's not directed toward godliness. So therefore, until you completely return it back to holiness and godliness, it requires a, a detox, a detoxification, detox. And what is that? He said that is chibut kever Because arishimu nisha dovuk beguf. So even when you return it to Gdusha, but the dust that was there, the dirt that had gathered, you can't just ignore it. It has an impact. And therefore, you want to remove that trace that remains attached to the body. Because you've eaten already with, a, with not the right intention. That food has entered you not in the right way. So it's like eating in an inappropriate way. So even if it's a proper food, but it has not been digested properly, so even if afterwards it gets corrected, you still need to correct that which was not digested properly, and that because it became part of your flesh and blood. Therefore. It needs to have a cleansing of the body that retains some of that stain, some of that dust, to cleanse and purify it from its contamination, even from kosher worldly pleasures and indulgences. Though it came from Klippus Nega and what he called the Jewish demons, Shedin Yehudayin. Okay. And he, then he gave the exception, which we discussed in the last year, Elim Kain. Unless you're dealing with a person and that person does not need it because he never benefited. He never enjoyed and indulged in the world. Even when he ate, he had no pleasure from it his entire life. So he doesn't need this. Because no, there, no, there was never a blemish, there was never a stain that affected or, or, or t- contaminated him. And we discussed it. Then he goes and we began the next example, which is in Devorim, in Dibur. We're talking now, not something, we'll soon talk about things that are off limits, you're not allowed to speak. But there's Devorim Mutorim, like he says, Devorim Betelim Beheter. That's someone that speaks, worthless discussion, which means it's not directed toward Tera, but it's Beheter. Why is it Beheter? Because it's dealing with a person, like a person, as instance, for example, an uneducated, uneducated person who's unable to study Torah, so you can't expect for him to study Torah. So what does he speak about? He speaks about things that are worthless, empty talk. And he specifically wants an example like that because we don't want something that's inherently toxic. It's only relatively. Why? Because he's not saying anything that's, that's not allowed to be spoken, like he's soon going to give an example of Lashon Hara, speaking evil about somebody. Or, or, or mockery, as we'll soon discuss more in detail. But here it's a person who couldn't study. Someone who could study Teda, as speaks Dvarim Betelim, that's a Nisr. That's Shol Shtip Satmeis. That's not what we're addressing now. We're addressing somebody who this is what he speaks about because he, he's, not, he's not unable to study Teda. So here you have an example, similar like the example of eating something kosher, but not Lashem Shemayim. The difference, however, is there was an action that became, as he said, part of your flesh and blood. Speaking does not become part of your flesh and blood because you're not consuming anything. So what's the story here? So here too says the Alter Rebbe, Tzorich letaya nafshei mituma. Mituma zu, the klipa zu. There too you have to undergo this person, so he did not sin, he must undergo a cleansing of his soul to purify it from the contamination with this klipa. With this klipa, this shell 
of worthless talk, which was not dedicated to God for that same reason. But here it didn't impact the body because it wasn't a food that you consumed. This was a speech. It was basically the state of the human being has been defiled to some extent. And here too you say, what kind of standard is? The person can't learn. What do you expect of them? Again, this is not a judgment or a critique. It's just that the, but the person is such a pure person and you don't want any blemish to remain. Therefore, we're giving bechesed, the kindness, like we discussed, the immune system has a way of, of cleansing even from that. And what is that cleansing? Ayideh gilgula bekafa kela. That this is achieved, gilgula is like a form of being, in this case, gil, like gilgul often means, like from the word galgal, a wheel that turns. And here it's, you can say it's like being flung in kafa kela. Kafa kela, like we learned about chibur takever, is one of the ways that we cleanse the body upon death after a person dies, God forbid. Kaf akela is a cleansing of the soul, and literally the word kaf, akela, means the hollow of a sling. Kela is like a sling. Now when you, let's say, shoot a stone, so if you look, there's the, in a sling, you see, there's like the pocket where you put the stone when you shoot it from one place to another. And this is an expression coming from the book of Shmuel. This is in the Novi. He talks about this person, Shmuel Aleph, Chofei Chavtes, that you will fling the spirit of your enemy like the hollow of a sling. The Alter Rebbe continues, Pashas B'Shalach Dafnun Tes. Omer Aleph. So it's Nun Tes. Pasha B'Shalach, the Alter Rebbe just writes the page number, which is 59, it's 59a, where he explains what this, what this is exactly, this Kafa Kela. So how do you explain what it means? So just as the body needs its cleansing, the soul also will go through a certain form of cleansing. That's like the spiritual immunity, immune system, immune system at work. Think of it like a cleaner's. When, when clothing gets uh, stained, and soiled and wrinkled, what do you do? You give it to a cleaners, and the cleaners have a process of how to cleanse it, how to get rid of the dust. First you shake it out, the dust, and how you wash it, and how you remove a stain. So in the spiritual cleansing system, or the, the spiritual detoxification of the things that we accumulate in our lifetime, both on more extreme levels or more milder levels, there's also an immunity. And now we're talking about an, an immunization or a, a, a detoxification would be a better word. Because we're not talking about immune, 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 immunizing before it happened. We're talking about the immunity system is coming now to get rid of the infection, or in this case, the stain. So the process, kafakela, is an example used that when you fling something from one end to the other, in a way it shakes it out. And that's actually the expression. So the Gemara talks about it in the in Masech the Shabbos, page 152b, Kufnun Beis Beis, that it's like when you, when you want to cleanse something, sometimes you have to throw it strongly from one end to another. Like you ever see, take a, a sheet or any other garment. You want to shake out the dust, you go out on the porch, you go outside, and what do you do? You just like, you just shake it out. That's the example here. But here we're not talking about it in the body level, we're talking on the soul level. In Lukuta Teir Pinchas, the Alter Rebbe explains it in a, in, a, in a psychological, spiritual way. And what is the point? That a neshama that lived in this life obviously has very deep consciousness and deep sensitivity. But when things have happened in life that are not pure, so it's affected the human being. We may not be fully aware of it. But after Meva Esrim Shana, one of the things that God implanted is they want to make the Neshama aware because half the cure of a problem is awareness. So how do you make the Neshama aware? You create an exercise. He actually says it's like an imaginary exercise. The Neshama is shown the life it just lived in Elam Hazah. As if it's, re it's recreating, it's like seeing a film of what happened in your life. That way you're not in denial. You see exactly. But now you see it with clear eyes. 
while a person is going through life, sometimes you minimize, there's denial, you, um, you ignore certain things, you distract yourself, but here you can't because we're now in the world of emes. So the nesham is shown everything. And that creates a painful situation because you're like reliving and seeing the things you did. So here, even though we're not talking about something that is a, a crime, we're just talking about something that someone spoke, something wasted, wasted words, but they were not directed toward the divine. And like we said, when it comes to love, every little thing matters. This causes pain, and this pain is a cleansing agent. That's the key thing to remember. It cleanses. That's the kafakela. So it causes great sar. The the Tzemach Tzedek and Eirat Teirah in Vayikra, um, volume 2, pages 482 and, and, and 483, talks in detail different ways that we explain Kafa Kela, if you want to look it up. He also brings there from the Sefer Ikrim, Sefer Ikrim from Yosef Alba, from Yosef Alba, where he talks about um, the same idea that the Neshama on one hand is, we know, is a pure soul. It's connected to God. On the other hand, it did engage in a material world. And there's a pain when the Neshama sees the contrast and it doesn't have quite one or the other. And that causes the soul's pain, that causes a cleansing. So we're talking now another form of ridding ourselves of another blemish and stain on a spiritual level that comes from Dvorim, like he said, Dvorim Betelim Beheter. And that is in Dibur. Now the Alter Rebbe is going to go, what about Dvorim Asurim? Diburim Asurim. Remember we also spoke, this is a toxin that we just spoke about that is more relative to the person and it's not completely toxic in the sense, completely off limits. But there are Diburim, when a person speaks, that are completely off limits. And that's going to be the next section. But we'll leave that for the next year. So to sum up, we're talking about a beautiful high standard and understanding how every blemish matters. You know, there's an expression in the Gemara, Ravav al Begit Talmud Chochem, that if there's a stain or something, some blemish on the garment of a Talmud Chochem, it's considered to be a very serious crime. That same stain on the garment of someone else is not considered such a big thing. Why? Because it's all relative to the person. The Gemara talks about Abchia, who wouldn't buy meat on credit because someone may see him buying the meat and not paying, and they think he's taking it without paying. But credit is a completely legitimate form of commerce, a form of uh, purpose you can pay later. But that level, so though we are not on that level, but Al Tadeba wants to explain what purity is, and therefore every blemish matters. And that's what we're learning here, of how to protect and how to preserve and how to cherish the life we were given. So everyone have a very good week. This has been Tanya Applied. Go to tanyaapplied.com if you want to ask any questions and also to see the archives of previous programs. Gutavach. This has been My Life, Tanya Applied with Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Please join us again next week. Visit chasidasupply.com for archived classes and more resources.